Um, Eric is uh, very fond of maps, and especially the missing ones. So he's going to enlighten us with his talk about how we can help out um, to fill up maps, basically, and um, with open data. Um, I think I will just let you start. Oh, there's more people coming in. Please sit down, he's almost about to start. And I know it's early, but I want, because we're not that many of us, I want to give him a big round of applause, please, for start. Woohoo! Thank you. Take it away. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Well, thanks for showing up on this ungodly hour on the Saturday morning. Um, let's get started. Hi, my name is Eric, and uh, this, this is what I do. Uh, a Geo Academy or Dutch Geo Academy, uh, that's, where, uh, that's the foundation I started in order to uh, train people in the use of geographic information systems. Um, Elevated Graphics is a startup, but it turned out to be just actually quite of a side project where we print 3D maps. Really neat, and I'll tell you more in the next slide. But the work I do is normally located at GeoFort. I don't know if. Has any one of you been to Geofort? <laughs> the Herald, yeah. Uh, Geofort is one of the Dutch, old Dutch fortresses, the, the waterline fortresses, and it is a museum for all things geographic, mapping, um, lo uh, location-based stuff. Um, and it won the prize for best children's and museum award. It won the children's and museum award, which is the prize for best children's museum last year, worldwide. So if you're based in the Netherlands, or if you are in the Netherlands, please come and visit GeoFort sometime. It is excellent. Um, these 3D maps I make, like this one, um, the one good thing about these maps is that in the Netherlands, we have an abundance of data available. It is extremely easy to make maps of the Netherlands, or of Germany, of any other European country, because we all have our data well prepared and organized. If you look at the, uh, the, uh, the open data site from the Dutch government, it says this morning we had 11,000 data sets available on all kinds of subjects. And it is lovely to see if I change this one a bit. If I go to that website, eleven thousand and nineteen. Was it eleven thousand and eighteen just now? Huh. Wait. What I found out that even if you look for come on. If you look for missing, you get a hit. So even missing data is in the Dutch portal for government data. That is amazing. But we're going to talk about missing maps because we have this, this richness in data in, in, in Europe. Um, there are loads of places in the world where data is actually missing. There is no such thing as a map of certain areas. Um, so what do we do? Well, we help them out. There is so much uh, uh, data from, um, there's so much um, imagery, satellite imagery, that it is pretty easy to start mapping. Just, well, we're called armchair mappers. We just sit back, take our laptops, and we start mapping. And that's the first step. But let me get back, and um, I'd like to do a short history on how did we get here. Why do we have missing maps at this moment? And I'll take you back with a, uh, a short uh, video clip, which is coming up. It's a YouTube from a, so Mr. That a certain person called Tim Berners-Lee. I also talked about community generated. In fact, I edited. This is the wiki map. This is the open street map. Terrace Theatre I actually put on the map because it wasn't on the map before TED last year. I this is the TED talk from Ted Berners-Lee in 2010. So. Mind I you. was not the only person editing the OpenStreetMap. Each flash 
on this visualization put together by ITO World shows an edit in 2009 made to the OpenStreetMap. Let's now spin the world during the same year. Every flash is an edit. Somebody somewhere looking at the OpenStreetMap and realizing it could be better. You can see Europe is ablaze with updates. Some places, perhaps not as much as they should be. Here, focusing on, in on Haiti, the map of Port-au-Prince at the end of 2009 was not all it could be. Not as good as the map of California. Fortunately, just after the earthquake, GOI, a commercial company, released satellite imagery with a license which allowed the open source community to use it. This is January, time lapse, people editing, that's the earthquake. Just a second. Now you see, there was hardly anything on the map. You see the timeline down there and what happens after the earthquake. And it is, I find that stunning and amazing how many uh, people were helping at that moment to make this whole after map. After the earthquake, Let's immediately see. people all over the world, mappers who wanted to help and could, looked at that imagery, built the map, quickly building up. We're focusing now on port au prince The blue is refugee camps these volunteers have spotted from the air. So now we have immediately a real-time map showing where there are refugee camps. It rapidly became the best map to use if you're doing relief work in Port-au-Prince. Witness the fact it's here on this Garmin device being used by rescue team in Haiti. There's the map showing on the left-hand side there that hospital. Actually, that's a hospital ship. This is a real-time map that shows blocked roads, damaged buildings, refugee camps. It shows things that are needed. So. If you've been involved in that at all, I just wanted to say whether, whatever you've been doing, whether you've just been shouting raw data now, you've been putting government or scientific data online, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you very much, and we have only just started. Yeah, yeah. Padum. We've only just started. It was 2010. Um, after that, we found out there were a lot of people who were helping out. And it is very easy, like in, in, in Port-au-Prince, in Haiti, at that earthquake, it was extremely easy to get volunteers to help. So if people are willing to help at the moment that there is an emergency, maybe you can find that collective as well for accidents waiting to happen, disasters waiting to happen. And that's where HOT comes in. Uh, and HOT, well, it's, it's kind of a strange name, um, because it's normally, uh, uh, it operates in areas which we in the Netherlands consider quite warm. Um, but it is Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. And the Humanitarian Open Street Map Team has been crucial in finding those places where accidents are waiting to happen and started mapping there. Now that's all good and well, but why would you start mapping for an area where an accident is waiting to happen? I mean, it could take 20 years, so why map today? So there were some issues with that. Now the Red Cross, Red Cross USA, UK and uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, they came together with HOT and they said, well, we've got so many projects where we, well, we lack maps. We are missing maps. Can we, you know, pull these resources and, and, and see if we can do that. And that's what's happening, and that's the Missing Maps project. And in the Missing Maps project, so the Red Cross or Médecins Sans Frontières, they point out these areas, this is what we want to do in the coming period of time. Please help us get maps from those areas. And that is what Missing Maps is about. So we're not just mapping just for the heck of it, but we're mapping for Red Cross. Well, the Dutch Red Cross picked that up very well, and at this moment we have people from the Dutch Red Cross everywhere, and also uh, they're al always helping out when we want to organize a mapathon. Now, the Missing Map Project is quite easy to understand what we do. We have three phases. Step one is the armchair mapper. That's us, potentially. So we just trace imagery and we turn it into open street map um, uh, streets or houses or whatever we can see and we can find. The second step is m just as important as that. That is local people. Because a trace of a line and you say it is a road, 
Well, it is a road, but what road is it? Nobody can see the name of the road from the air. Well, that is a challenge, of course. Please go ahead. But um, So we, we don't know. It, it is a building, but what kind of building is it? Is it a house? Is it a shop? Is it a school, a church? We don't know. So local volunteers have to add this data to it. But at least we gave them the starting point. We, gave them a, we give them a blank map, and they can just fill in the, with their local, local knowledge. That makes the map. And the third step is the map is being used. The map is being used by um, all kinds of NGO or other humanitarian uh, helpers in the field. Like this guy, for instance. When he's, he's probably looking up something on a map. Otherwise, why would he be on this slide? So this is, uh, this is Missing Maps. Now last year, at the end of the year, um, it was a two-year update. What did we achieve in two years' time? And this is what happened. There were 430 public mapathons. We did about, uh, I think in these, those two years, those first two years, I think we did about 20 in the Netherlands. That's pretty good. But if you look there, 5.6 million buildings mapped. And what was it? Oh, here it is, people mapped. And we were uh, aiming for 20 million at a time. 20 million people we want to map. Why map people? Well, you can't map people, but you can map houses. Why do you want to do that? Well, for example, if you have a vaccination program in an area which is very, you know, disease prone, um, what you need is kind of a, what they call the herd immunity. If a certain percentage of the people is vaccinated, is immu immunized, and at that time the disease will, you know, it will, it will die out for something. But how many vaccines do you have to bring along? How many houses are there? How many people are there? Those are the kind of things you don't even know. You're blind without a map. Let me give you an example. This is uh, the area of uh, Thunga in Malawi, and uh, this is what the map looked like. But the issue is that at this area, in this area, thousands of people live here, and it's there's nothing. You don't know where to start. So that's where we come in and we do mappings. Now we do that in a process which is uh, it's it's a three-step process, but we added a few extra steps. Um, Dutch uh, Red Cross came up with map swipe. Map swipe, yeah, that's exactly that's that's what you do, swipe. <laughs> but you do it on your phone probably. Uh, map swipe is an app that you can all download and use. It is a very simple one. Um, part of the world are tiled, map tiles, and you get one tile, and the question is, do you see a house on this map, or on this tile, on this image? If you do. Press yes. If you don't, press no or swipe it away, and it's done. It's a very simple, extremely simple app, and you can just, you know, s help out people. But if you, if, if in a certain area there's no houses, you know, don't even go looking for it on your formal map application. Just swipe it away. Um, then we organize these mapathons, missing maps mapathons. It's all some M and M and M stuff. Great, um, and, you, and we, we organize these things and people start editing the map. How do we do that? Well, HOT organized a, tar uh, a tasking manager. So we've got all kinds of projects. For example, here you see a project from the Dutch Red Cross, and it's about this area, and in this area some things have to be mapped. Now it's all in tiles, you see the, the different colors on the tiles, that's the status, if something has been done already or it's done com completely or it's validated already. Um, and this is how we break it up into pieces. And this is what makes it easy to map, even if you are with a mapping party of about 200 persons, you can all start editing on the same data. Because you're not editing the same uh, lines, the same polylines, you're just editing your own part of the world. Because, um, well, it's 
conflict handling in, in, in those things is pretty, uh, can, be, um, <coughs> can be a bit of a pain. So we split it up into tiles. And that's, how that's what we do. Then afterwards, we send out these volunteers and they collect the extra data. Uh, now, last year, these kind of things came in as well. Um, of course, the, the, the large mapping companies already uh, have done this for some time, um, but the Red Cross have also started using these um, for all kinds of additional information. They uh, drive around and see what, what's going on there. And the imagery is, for example, in a mapillary uh, um, project, uh, you can trace it back and see what's going on in certain areas and complete the map that way. Now, this is the area of Thunga. This is not too clear on this screen, but it's the area of Thunga after some mapping occurred. And I'll show you uh, uh, how it is today. Let's get back to this one. Because um, it looks really good. It's this, and I'll show you this one. Th oh, Thunga. Sorry. It's this area. Now this is the this is the area which you looked on earlier. The area of Thunga with this T area there down. Uh, but if you zoom in now, you see that there's lots more to see. There's all kinds of houses and roads and paths and tracks and going on here. So at this moment we have the blind map of that area. By being able to count the number of houses here, we can make estimates of how many people live there, what to bring, what to do in this area. So this is a typical example of before and after. Now you might ask, what does Google have on these areas? What does Bing Maps have or Yahoo Maps? Um, if you look at it, is, it is similar to what we have in the Netherlands on, on our uh, governmental data, or open data. Um, here, there's almost nothing. Um, I've, I've always wondered why that is, and the answer seems pretty obvious. There's no commercial interest in these areas. There's no money to be made by you know, selling ads or, or, or having people run around with mobile apps by, by Google or something else. So there's no need for them to finish the map in these areas. Uh, OpenStreetMap is in large parts of the world the best map there has ever been. And that's, it's all voluntary work. It's, it's a strange situation that volunteers do so much better job than governments or companies or, or whoever is being paid normally to make maps. Um, I find it astounding, but it's still, it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's a good feeling doing st stuff like that. Anyway, so after we have these things, what else do we do? Well, there is so many things you can do. When, once you have data, you can analyze it and use for all kind of things. For example, the travel time to hospitals or there is the, the whole GIS work comes in again and there are so many more things to do. Uh, logistics is of course the most important thing in these areas. Uh, excellent prediction of where do disasters happen um, when you have the houses, when you have the, where all the people live, you see the track of a hurricane coming along, you know where to go. Especially if a hurricane comes along, you know there is probably in the first two, three weeks or so after a disaster, there's no phone connection, there's no, well, there's nothing. Where do you start? These kind of things, these data analysis, they, they help uh, in order to, to get the stuff to the places where it's most needed. We are spoiled here. We are extremely spoiled. We don't even consider a map to be something important because it is so basic. It's like, you know, tap water. 
we know if, if, if one of your apps with Maps is not working anymore, you just, you know, you, you take the next one. It is so easy. But it's the first thing you need whenever you go somewhere. Yesterday, somebody came to our village tent, a map time village, and he said, I kind of get lost here on this area. Can we get the map from the uh, Sha uh, area? Can we get, can we get it on, on my OSM end? It's like, I mean, there's five roads here or something. You get lost here in five roads. I mean, excellent. That's how bad we need maps nowadays. It's incredible. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you some live uh, status for today. And uh, next is I'll tell you about 510 Global a bit. And but let me say this first. Today at 11 after this talk, we go to the Map Time Village, and I hope some of you will join me. Um, and uh, we'll we'll get some hands-on experience in mapping. We'll teach you how to map if you don't know it, or if you do, please come out and help. Uh, we're behind the Italian Embassy on uh, Flowers Field. Uh, pretty easy to find uh, because we have a very colorful flag, you know, something like a rainbow, and it says map time. It's easily dis distinguishable. Um, and after that, um, there's of course, during this whole uh, uh, during the whole Shaft Festival, we have the Mapathon uh, going on. You're always welcome to join. Uh, we have some, uh, some projects where w we can use some hands-on. Uh, if you want more, there's a new initiative. It's called 510 Global. And now 510 Global, there we go again. Uh, 510 Global is, uh, is an initiative by the Dutch Red Cross. Uh, and it is for all kinds of data scientists, geo scientists, whatever you are. Um, there's about 40 people working at the moment, but it's not full time. It's all volunteers or students or uh, PhDs who have nothing to do after they finish their PhD. Um, and they help out, but they don't help out uh, with the, the usual Red Cross stuff, but they do data science there. So there's all kinds of neat projects. So if you have some spare time, you're most welcome to join. The uh, website is at 510.global. Um, and it's, of course, it says things like how we help from the field to the desk via data, etc. All kinds of lovely stuff. That's one thing. And the other thing I promised you is that we're going to have uh, I'm going to show you what's happening at this moment. And that was at the, what's that, slash leaderboard? Yep. Um, this is the, uh, this will be the uh, actual situation on how much we did. Because we tag everything. OpenStreetMap has a, a lovely tagging system. So we tag everything with hashtag missing maps to see how many, uh, what's what we did. And here you see the total edits done by people under the hashtag missing maps. And so far today, last commit five minutes ago, uh, 10 million buildings have been mapped during the missing maps uh, uh, project and over a million kilometers of roads. That's neat, isn't it? It's fun. Now, of course, it's a leaderboard and a leaderboard with just one thing on it. That's, uh, that's, that's no fun, of course. Let's see. Let's, let's compare something. Uh, at uh, Sha, uh, yesterday we started. We did, 100 oh. we did 141 edits already. <laughs> that's Okay, we just had 20 minutes. Come on, give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But by the end of the festival, of course, uh, we, we should... Well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've set up two others. Uh, let me get there. ITC, uh, which is a part of the uh, University of Twente, uh, and they do all kinds of advanced stuff with, uh, um, with satellite imagery. Uh, they, they did... Uh, over 50,000 buildings in the in the last year. <sighs> I'm not sure if we can make that, but I think uh, the Dutch Cadaster, which is the formal mapping agency in the Netherlands, 
Uh, they did only 30,000 edits. I think we can beat that in a week. <laughs> but I need you to help me. 20, 22,000 buildings, 4,000 kilometers of roads. I think we can do that in a week. I mean, I would be really, really glad, and it would give me something you know, to, uh, to point out to the Dutch cadaster that they have to do a much better job than, than what they're doing at the moment. I, I, it, it would really be great if we could do in one week, we could do more than the Dutch cadaster has done so far in the Missing Maps project in two years' time. I would be really glad if you'd help me with that. Come on. Okay, so we're at a map time village, Flowers Field, can't miss it, it's very easy. You just, you know, you follow the coffee and just pass the coffee, take one with you if you want, and we're there. You're most welcome to join, thank you. So, thank you so much. I was wondering if there are any questions. If they are, could you please ask them at the microphone since this session is recorded? Yeah. It's on. Hello. Um, two questions. One is, uh, do you know of any... Closer to the mic, please. Do you know of any legal issues with using satellite imagery to update, update the maps? Do you work for Microsoft, by the way? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no the, one of the good things, uh, uh, at this festival, there's always, you know, there's, there's always open versus closed and stuff like that, of course. Uh, but uh, Bing Maps uh, the, the has offered all their imagery for humanitarian purposes. You know, we're free to use them, we can do whatever we want with them, as long as it's for humanitarian purposes. So for OpenStreetMap, editing this way, excellent. Okay, M my second question is, um, what about topographical information? I, I mean, I know of some roads where it may take uh, somebody to drive two hours on two kilometers. So this could, I, I can imagine this is very important for rescue workers. It's especially for uh, navigational purposes. Um, well, I'm not sure about that. What, 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 what is most important to us is that it, it f the, the whole structure of roads forms a network so that you can navigate it. But the speed you're driving on it, y you know it's not fast there. I mean, <laughs> people who work there know about, can, can estimate very well how, yeah. But thank you. Hi. Um, where can I find the... Uh, SHA 2017 map. <laughs> on on OpenStreetMap, you mean? Could well you repeat the question one more time, uh, Eric? Sorry? Could you repeat the question one yeah, more where, time? Yeah, where can we find the SHA 2017 map on OpenStreetMap? Well, um, I, I'm not sure. We didn't make it yet. There's, of course, there's the SHA, the, the map of the festival area, and there's OpenStreetMap, but they haven't been connected yet. Now we've we've been uh, doing some uh, some uh, uh, yesterday afternoon on that, but to see if we can get those map tiles from the Sha map, but it's yeah, it's not that bad. On OpenStreetMap, it will most likely not come on because it is a temporary event. So somebody has to map it and then delete it after a week. Uh, it's okay. It's a good joke, but it's kind of. So in, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if you, but if you're welcome to help him map it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's one in the back. You can go first. Uh, yes, um, about, about uh, the version information. Eh? Do you plan also plan with OpenStreetMap to actually have uh, having older maps, for example, completely back to the Roman time, so you can see how the maps have developed over time? I did get something on, on uh, all the yeah. maps, but... Uh, yeah, but maybe or we're having kind of history slider, so you can slide back all the way to year zero, uh, and then actually see the maps of the Roman times, also in uh, uh, actually integrated database of OpenStreetMap. Um, that is, it is not in the formal OpenStreetMap program. Um, I know some people who did some backtracking of maps during the ages. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, for example, uh, there's something the Dutch cadaster made called Topo Tijdreis. Uh, uh, that is nice, but it goes back to the 1800s and not mm -hmm. Roman times. But there are uh, 
there there is at least there's one um, initiative from the uh, um, uh, Groninger Archiven. You're Dutch, by the way. Yes. So you understand Groninger Archiven? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, and they have this this wh where all the they have about 50,000 maps mm -hmm. from all throughout history in 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 that area. Um, they've all scanned them, okay. but they didn't put energy referencing on it. It's just scanned as it was on paper. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and there is a, uh, a crowdsourced program going on at the moment there in order to get all those maps on the right location. Okay. So maybe that is something, but we can talk afterwards after that okay. about that. Hey, Eric. Um, sorry. Thank you for your uh, interesting uh, project and introducing this to us. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, do you collaborate as well with Hans Rosling and uh, yeah, the man who died earlier this year with Gapminder? So these data are these connectable? Um, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, I know, I know who, who you were talking about. Unfortunately, um, um, he makes some excellent things, but I'm not sure if it, it's all data related. But it's it's not on topographic maps like OpenStreetMap. But what he does what he did in his field of work was excellent of course it brought so much attention to uh, to the true problems on on healthcare in the world but it, it, there is no direct link between uh, open street map i think and yet not not as far as i know yeah wouldn't that be great actually to have more precise data there well they they do things uh, at gapminder they do things on a global level but they don't zoom into specific locations. What we do is we work on OpenStreetMap on the tiniest detail we can get and then work upwards to the global level. Uh, so that is a zoomable map. Uh, Gapminder has a story to tell, which is it's kind of a different purpose. But it, yeah, they you should meet they're, they're most welcome, of course, to use OpenStreetMap data on that, yeah. And I think they know about it. Everyone knows about OpenStreetMap data. Eric, is there a level of collaboration? Could you please data? step closer to the mic, please? Thank you. Is there a level of collaboration and data integration between OpenStreetMap and, say, Google Maps or other commercial mapping providers? Uh, there's at least some, some nice stories going on about that. For example, at Apple Maps, uh, Apple Maps, uh, the, the, the board of uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, went to Apple Maps and said, it's, it's lovely that you use our data, but we have, you know, there's rules about that. And where's the attribution? And at Apple they said, oh, we're not using OpenStreetMap data. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> but it's using and it's not collaborating. That's <laughs> so they're using your data and you're not using theirs? Uh, no, not as far as I know. I think that OpenStreetMap. I think there's always talk going, but I'm, I'm not that deep into. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. No yeah. problem. Uh, I have a question about the, the question that someone asked earlier, and then you said we can make a SHA 2017 map, but then we have to delete it afterwards. And I just want to kind of provide more information on that. In fact, we don't have to delete it because it's a wiki. So whatever you make, we'll leave a record on the system anyway, and then you can map it or tag it as disused. And so it will still be there. It's ten, it can still be retrieved afterwards, and it will be a kind of a historical data that a lot of people, if they would like to find it afterwards, they can still my, uh, find it. Well, I'd be happy to give that a try. So let Please come over to the map time village and, and we'll see. We're going to do uh, later this, this week, we go on Sunday, I think, we're going to do some uh, a mapping party for this area, but we intend to do it for what is actually here and what stays here. But maybe we can do the temporary stuff as well. Uh, but I know that the guy who made the map for uh, at uh, map uh, .sha 2017.org. Um, he is uh, responsible for quite a few other things at this moment. 
So I tend to bring him, I intend to bring him here, but it's, I'm not sure if I can get them, get him, so. Okay, but, cool, let's do yeah, that. Yeah, but let, bring him on. Um, how do you decide which parts or which areas to map in these mapathons or other events? Uh, well, there's two things. Uh, one is that the uh, Red Cross asks, local Red Cross uh, branches, they ask, we are going to do something here, please help us, can you give us a map? Comes to the Dutch Red Cross, or well, that's at least what we do in the Netherlands, and they set up projects for that. Then you have larger areas, that's where the map swipe comes in. You tile it up, you see, okay, there's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, uh, there's something, there's something, there's something. Then you have a project, but only those pieces left where somebody said there's at least one house in there and then we start mapping so that's the process of it's in cooperation with the Red Cross so they it always is on messy maps yes all uh, Médecins Sans Frontières uh, Doctors Without Borders but that's that's the two main entrances for missing maps and how does that combine with your 3D maps <laughs> not at all <laughs> there, there's one thing I earn money with and one thing I do for fun and actually, I do everything for fun, so it's... Mm. Ah. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, that was just an example to set for how much data we have and that I can use all these data to... Well, we ran a bit out of the slot of the time, but for the sake of coolness, I thought it was a good idea to just uh, let the questions pass. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. And I counted you. We are with 50-ish. So if everyone does uh, 600 edits, we can make the 30,000, right? <laughs> Go for it. Woo! Cheers. Mm.